All right, let's get started. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to the MIT Mobility Forum organized by the MIT Mobility Initiative. Uh, I'm Jinghua Zhao, Professor of Cities and Transportation at MIT. Uh, today, I'm really uh, glad to have uh, Professor Joe Zadini uh, to present to us his research on co-design of complex system from autonomy to future mobility. Uh, as we all know, transportation is a uh, complex system, uh, multi-component, multi-layers, multi-stakeholders. Uh, uh, Joe will argue that uh, there are at least two reasons for this to design such system to be difficult, right? One is uh, among the multiple component of a heterogeneous nature and a field, we had to make simultaneous choices, right? Uh, two, there are different stakeholders. They sometimes collaborate, sometimes they conflict. I often have uh, multiple different objectives. So no one in the system owns the knowledge of all the component and all the interactions among them. So for example, between vehicle design and transportation system and that, right? So for a long time, we kind of uh, manage this by just com compartmentalize them, right? As a transportation system designer, we know to a limited degree of how the vehicle work, but we don't need to know the nuances of each. Yeah. Similarly, as a vehicle designer, you understand generally about the traffic flow, the light, the multimodal design, but don't you don't have the expert on this, right? So historically, kind of a reasonable work, not perfect, but reasonable work. But now with the automated vehicles, with connected vehicle technology, the coupling between the vehicle level thinking to the system thinking is more and more tight on this, right? To the degree that it is, we may make very uh, uh, significant errors or mistakes if we focus just on one aspect and ignore the other. But how do you handle that? So Professor Zardini will present a framework to co-design a complex system leveraging the monotone theory of co-design and tools from game theory, right? This framework will be initiated, is instantiated in the task of design the future mobility system, all the way from the policies that the city can design to the autonomous vehicle as part of the autonomous, autonomous mobile on demand system there, right? So here, the proposed approach will try to allow one to efficiently answer heterogeneous questions Unify different modern techniques and promote interdisciplinarity, modularity, and uh, compositionality. Right. Before I introduce Zadini more formally, I do want to warm up the audience a little bit. Uh, as uh, as before, please in the chat, uh, type in your organization, and uh, location and time, so uh, Joe can know a little bit about the the background of the the audience here. So I'll say MIT, Cambridge, uh, twelve. Yeah, while you're doing that, let me reinforce the norm of this uh, uh, forum. I invite everybody to contribute to one idea, either in the form of a question uh, to Professor Zardini or a comment to his uh, presentation. And you can type them directly into the chat. And in the part three of the session, we'll try to curate the, uh, the question and uh, invite uh, uh, Professor Zardini to respond. <laughs> so Joe Zardini is an incoming assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Environment Engineering at MIT starting fall 2024. We'll re really look forward to move you from the West Coast to the East Coast, uh, Joe. Uh, he will be a PI at the Laboratory for Information and Decision uh, System, at LIS, and as part of the Institute for Data System and Society, IDSS. Currently, he's a postdoc scholar, uh, scholar in the Department of uh, Ar uh, Ar Ar at Stanford, uh, working with Professor Michael Pavon. Uh, he received his PhD in mechanical engineering with a focus on robotics, system, and control from ETH Zurich in 2023. His research aims to develop efficient computational tools and algorithm approaches to formulate and solve complex interconnected system design and autonomous decision-making problems. His research interests include the co-design of a socio-technical socio system, Compositionality in engineering, applied category theory, decision and control, optimization, and game theory, with applications to specific to intelligent transportation system, autonomy, and complex network and infrastructure. Uh, without further ado, let me pass the forum to Professor Zadini. Joe, please. Thank you very much, Jinwa. <clears throat> Thank you very much, everyone, for uh, showing up and also. Uh, I've been a huge fan of this uh, mobility forum for a while, and it's it's an honor to to give a talk now. Uh, so as Jinwa said, I will present uh, some work on co-design, 
Uh, and actually, uh, I'm substituting uh, Marco Pavone today uh, due to last minute changes, but somehow the title he was thinking about can be adapted. And uh, uh, I will present something about rethinking society critical systems uh, with co-design. So as a disclaimer, I'm about to set up my group at MIT. And today, I my, my feeling is that I will pose more problems than the ones uh, <laughs> I will actually be able to solve. So this is meant to be a starting uh, uh, piece for, for my lab at MIT. So uh, I like to visualize complexity of systems uh, starting from what I started with in my research. So I started looking at autonomous systems uh, as an example of complex systems. Uh, here with the idea of having these systems uh, performing positive societal impact. And here, depending uh, on what you like, rough, yeah. Uh, your yeah. slides now show you. Uh, oh, yeah. Please share the slide. We we took it down a moment ago. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> oh, I thought okay. Yeah, I, not I nice. Them yeah. Down. Yeah. Okay. All right. Perfect. Can you see them now? Yes. Okay. Nice. So I was talking without a background. All right. Yeah. What I was saying is I started uh, uh, working on this area uh, by focusing on autonomous systems, in particular, focusing on positive societal impacts of these systems. And now, depending on the field you like, you might think of these as autonomous vehicles providing safer and more efficient mobility. Uh, you could think about autonomous robots for space exploration. You could think about very small robots to perform uh, um, monitoring tasks. Or you can even think about robots that help you in uh, performing search and rescue tasks. Now, the bottom line for all of these systems is that we typically develop, deploy these technologies and develop these technologies by thinking about uh, them in a controlled environment. But the real key uh, uh, impact or, or societal impact will happen if we design the technologies together with the environment that we'll be deploying in. Right? If you think about a mobility system, as Jinwa said, here, one thing is developing a autonomous vehicle uh, uh, technology in the lab. One other thing is to integrate it within existing mobility systems. And here my take is that there is always the heaven and hell for, for, for doing this. For autonomy, heaven is, uh, you know, there are projections that show that you, you will just need 30% of the cars you have around today to, to serve the same demand that first and last mile mobility will be more attractive and convenient, and that transportation as a whole will be more affordable and sustainable. On the other end, we are very well aware of the potential negative consequences of technologies that are implemented in bad ways. For instance, you could increase congestion. It's not clear yet how the computing, increased computing needs of these uh, technologies will, uh, will be sustainable, sustainability uh, friendly, and so on. So, uh, my research is all about this, is all about this idea that uh, slowly we understand well single components, but we still lack tools to formally and practically design systems that are made of multiple components. So in today's short talk, I will, first of all, uh, uh, ground this work with some uh, more precise motivation. I will then uh, talk about tools to solve these problems. First, I will introduce a theory of co-design, and second, I will talk about strategic interactions. Uh, and all of, and then I will provide an outlook about the, the research that I want to do at MIT. All of what you see uh, here in this talk is available on my webpage, uh, and, and I'm happy to discuss offline if you have particular questions. All right, but I really want to now get started and, and first of all, address the particular uh, question of what do you mean with co-design, right? Co-design is an overloaded term and different fields mean different things. Here, really what I'm trying to do is thinking about a uh, framework to automate or support the task of designing complex systems. And it's a very broad perspective. We would typically think about minimizing some resource usage. This could be uh, monetary cost, energy, uh, externalities, but it could also be errors with respect to a pre-described mission you want to you want to fulfill. And typically, you want to do that uh, by specifying some functionality constraints by uh, obtaining some desired behavior. So, in some sense, what we want to do is to be able to specify some tasks for the systems, specify some multi-domain knowledge characterizing the system, and then specifying some design options we want to choose. 
uh, and we want some magic to happen and we want optimal designs to be produced or at least um, uh, actionable information to, to decide which design we want to, to implement. So to be a bit more concrete, think about the context of autonomy. Here we want to design an autonomous vehicle Maybe we want to specify the kind of tasks we want to we want the vehicle to uh, be able to perform. Then we want to specify robot autonomy and physics principles. And here the kind of things we want to design are the components and the algorithms. And uh, the performance metrics could be the errors with respect to the task and the energy consumption. The very same approach though can be scaled up to designing an entire mobility ecosystem where here the task could be thought of as the demand uh, and the kind of preferences of each uh, traveler. The principles are the networks, operations, and infrastructure principles. And here the actual things you want to design are the mobility services or the policies. And again, here the uh, performance metrics could be thought of as investments and performance of your system. Now, why is it hard to come up with the magic inside this uh, automated designer block? There are at least three reasons, I think. The first one is that when designing these complex systems, you need to consider many components at different levels, right? Uh, imagine designing a fleet of autonomous vehicles. Here you need uh, engineers thinking about actuation, computation, sensing, control, perception, planning. You have things that are at the hardware level, things that are at the software level, things that are a bit in between, right? Liability, regulation, ethics. And the typical reaction, if you imagine being at an analyst uh, session, it's to say, oh my God, there are too many components. I don't even know how to understand the whole uh, system. And more importantly, I'm afraid to make choices because I don't know what the effect of these choices will be on the system. And uh, the diagnosis for this uh, illness is that we lack a tool that is at the same time formal, quantitative, but also intellectually tractable. The second layer of complexity comes from the fact that not only we have many interconnected components, but these components are at different levels, right? So for the example of autonomy, here you have to design single components, such as a sensor, here you see lighters. Then you have to put these components together in a good way to produce a platform, uh, here an autonomous vehicle. Then you have to take many of these vehicles and deploy them in a particularly good way to perform some sort of service, and then at the city level, you want to take all of these services and make sure they are orchestrated in a way that is uh, uh, sustainable for society, right? So you see many components, many scales. And the and the, this can be exploded for every particular component, right? If you think about the particular problem of controlling and deploying a fleet of autonomous vehicles, there are all sorts of operational and planning constraints that you need to consider. And the final level of complexity comes from the fact that, as Jinwa mentioned in the introduction, these systems are not uh, designed by a dictator that can decide everything, but really uh, result as a collaboration or competition between many stakeholders. And here you can think of designing a mobility system in Boston. You have mobility providers, liability companies, policymakers, academia, tech developers, and industry partners. And here, not only they reason in different ways about the very same problem, so we need a tool that kind of unifies their thoughts, but also they care about different things. So we are not really looking for optimizing something, but we are looking at equilibria of a, an interaction process. So to really summarize quickly these co complexities, um, we on one end have large systems made of many components with different scales, different objectives. And on the other end, we have strategic interactions with different stakeholders. Uh, now, if we want to design a tool, that deals with all of these issues. Those are the six golden rules that I believe we should be able to, to follow uh, continuously. So the tool has to be formal and domain independent. We don't want to over-specify for a particular domain that would defeat the purpose of creating something that can be translated across disciplines. Usually this comes uh, with the orthogonal constraint, which is we want something to be computationally tractable. We need to be solving these huge problems that I showed before. Uh, it has to be compositional and hierarchical by nature, compositional in the sense that we consider the many components, but also hierarchical in the sense that we consider the different scales at which the components uh, are, are uh, operating. 
it has to be collaborative and intellectually tractable. Ideally, I have to take the knowledge of all the people in this audience uh, and, and pull this knowledge. But also, I don't want to have these systems where you have a system architect who is the only person that is able to understand what's going on. So I need an intellectually tractable framework. And finally, I need continuity. I need something that is able to adapt over time and, and react to changes in, in the system and design. So the first part of the talk covers some uh, uh, things about the first challenge, and then I will briefly touch base on the second one. Uh, here, I'm really showing the gist of everything, and I'm happy to discuss offline if you have questions about the details. So the, the first level of complexity is, is addressed by uh, introducing a new way of thinking about the system. Here, co-design stands for collaborative, computational, compositional, and continuous design. And I'm really looking forward to hearing more co-words to, to expand the branding uh, of this kind of uh, tool we are developing. The tool leverages domain theory, applied category theory, and optimization. And in particular, in the next few slides, I want to make clear what I mean by design problems, how do I define the constraints between these, these, these different uh, components uh, and their interconnections, and how to solve efficiently these problems. So by the end of this first part of the talk, you will understand what the diagrams are that you can find in my papers and that could look a bit obscure and how to get uh, through optimization to some Pareto fronts of optimal solutions. Now, if you are scared about the words like domain theory and applied category theory, because those are kind of niche fields, don't worry. I was in the same situation a few years ago. Uh, and this talk is user-friendly, so there is no need to understand these things. But if you know something about those things, uh, there's going to be some pro box with some Easter eggs. Uh, which explain these concepts. Now, I am shamelessly uh, advertising some efforts in this direction. If you, after this talk, you like the tools and you want to learn more, we are writing a book about the subject. I will be offering a class at MIT this fall uh, about this, these ideas, and I'm very happy to hear about new people willing to learn this. So the key idea to understand this co-design framework is to think about design in terms of three spaces. Every time you want to design a particular component, uh, you think about the implementation space, which is the actual uh, things you want to design, the actual options you have. Typically, they exist because they provide a functionality or a desired behavior. And typically, providing this functionality comes at a cost or a requirement. And now, depending on the field you're from, you might know these spaces with different names. You know, functionalities could be desired behaviors, specifications, objectives, guarantees, or conclusions. And costs could be budgets, requirements, dependencies, or assumptions. The key insight is that we want to be able to uh, model functionalities and resources in a quantitative way. And we will use the notion of partial ordered sets. Partial ordered sets are a mathematical tool that allows you to model costs in engineering, such as uh, uh, energy, real numbers, or enumerable things like natural numbers, but also allow you to say that you don't prefer something over something else. Because sometimes the problems are complex, and you cannot really uh, say that, that something is preferred over something else. Right, so you guys are in the Boston, many of you are in the Boston area, so you could come up with a partial order of food preferences that says that you prefer lobster over lobster roll and lobster bisque. And you don't prefer lobster roll over clam chowder or, or bisque, right? You have this uncertainty of what you like more. On a more serious note, when you are, for instance, deploying autonomous vehicles, you might create a partial order of rules of the road uh, for instance, you might care about collision more than air evaluation and clearance, uh, but you don't prefer air evaluation over clearance. And here, you can use this order to induce an order on the actual trajectories of your vehicle. Or if you come from information theory background, you could think of a partial order of positive definite matrices uh, that are ordered by the ellipsoids inclusion of the ellipsoids they represent. This is only some of the examples of things you can do with partial orders. Really, the idea is that these partial orders unlock a full set of uh, uh, cost structures that you can explore. Now, uh, from now on, I will model these two spaces quantitatively with partial orders. And the key idea to understand, and, and it's the only equation of this, of this talk, I really don't want to make this technical, is that we, given this quantitative uh, way of modeling costs, we want to answer feasibility questions. So we model a feasibility relation or a design problem as something of this form, which is simply answering the question, 
given a functionality or a desired behavior and given a resource or a budget that I have available, does there exist a design that at least gives me what I want by requiring at most what I have available, right? This is a monotone map in these particular spaces because if I suddenly become less picky and I want less desired behaviors or less functionalities, this should not provide require more resources. And on the other hand, if I'm suddenly richer in resources, this should not provide less functionalities. Now, in technical terms, this is called the Boolean profunctor. And I will, in my diagrams, you see those represented as this kind of blocks with uh, functionalities on the left and resources on the right. Now, the first question you might come up with is, okay, what do I do with this? This is a very abstract uh, uh, formula. How can I make use of it as an engineer? In engineering, there are different ways of populating these feasibility relations, right? You can think of catalogs, right? You have components and the existence of these components it's, it's a way to specify properties of these components, right? So uh, the fact that a component exists gives you a relationship between different properties of these components. Sometimes you have first principles. Sometimes you can say, for instance, the, when designing a drone, that the energy required by a mission, it's always greater or equal the duration of the mission times the power consumption. And this is something that's true no matter which component you're looking at, no matter which particular uh, drone you're looking at. And the last piece, which is the most important, is that sometimes you only have selected points, feasibility points, and those is what I call data-driven or on-demand uh, way of populating your feasibility relations. And those points could be obtained by experiments, black box simulations, or optimization problems. That's not important. The important thing is that with this notion of feasibility, you're able to embed this knowledge uh, into your design process. Now, the reason why I really like this tool is that not only it's clear what a design problem is, but it's clear how to take multiple of those design problems and interconnect them with each other, right? I can put them in series, I can put them in parallel, I can have a feedback operation, I can be choosing between two options or trying to convince two experts. And in the end, the composition of any two design problems in these ways will return again a design problem. So I have a closure property, and this becomes a very practical tool when I have a large problem made of many components that are interconnected and I want to decompose the large problem into the knowledge of the subcomponents. And the magic out of all of this is that I can do all of this at the graphical level, so I don't need to understand much of the math that's going on in the background. And I can do that and I will be safe, everything will work because there are some uh, formal methods in the background that allow you to, to do so, okay? so. This is a tool that is very simple to understand. It models relationships between properties of your systems and components can be interconnected. So going back to the original quest, this is formal, right? I haven't specified a particular domain and also it's compositional and hierarchical by nature. Now, what does it mean to solve these problems? So far, I just talked about specifying the problems. How do you solve them? There are essentially two queries. The first one is given some functionality to be provided, I want to find the minimal resources that uh, provide it or the, the set of design that minimizes resource consumption. Or in the other way, I could be given a budget and I want to maximize functionalities I get out of the system. The two problems are dual and for the narrative, I will continue just with the first one. And here the idea is that we will be looking for a map from functionalities to upper sets of feasible resources. Or uh, if you really care about the optimal solutions, a map from functionalities to anti-chain of optimal resources. Anti-chain is a fancy word to say Pareto front, uncomparable solutions. So for instance, the ones you see here uh, with these dots. So in terms of optimization, this is a new class of optimization problems that's a bit exotic. The class of optimization problems is specified by a graph where the nodes are the design problems and the edges are the interconnections between them. The variables are these partial orders that I introduced. And then you have two kinds of constraints. You have the, the constraint that each node has to be a feasibility relation. And the second one is that whenever you put systems in series, the resources required by a system should not exceed the functionality provided by another one. You could think of it in terms of physical uh, examples. The resources required, like the energy required by a process should not exceed the energy provided by another process. And the entire objective is to minimize resource consumption at the system level. Now, I want to briefly note 
that so far I just assumed this structure of, of partial orders and feasibility relations, and I never talked about convexity, differentiability, continuity, and not even uh, definitions of uh, problems on continuous spaces. You could have, you could have a mix of the two. So for optimization people in the audience, this is very bad news usually, right? Not only the setting is exotic, but also you don't have any property of interest. Well, the, the cool thing is that there is a tool to solve these problems. Uh, here in the class, we are teaching about the subject. We need approximately two hours to go in the details, uh, but I want to give you, you, you to, to know the very, the very high level details of this. So the, the idea is that the problem, the complexity is that you are given some solution maps for some nodes of your problem, and you want to find the solution map for the entire diagram, right? And here, the tools we are using allow us to find a compositional approach to, to solving this problem, which means that you can solve the composition of problems as the composition of the solutions you have. In practice, this gives you a constructive way to build an algorithm that can solve these problems efficiently. Uh, and you have, you have essentially two take home messages. The first one is that the algorithm can solve these problems, uh, find a, a set of all, all optimal solutions or a certificate of infeasibility. And the second big good news is that the complexity is not combinatorial in the actual number of options you have. So you, you, the complexity doesn't scale, doesn't explode, right? And this is great because we have these many, many components we want to optimize for. Now, of course, this is computationally tractable, going back to the original quest. But I also want to reassure you that you don't have to understand all of what I presented so far to be able to use this tool. There is a programming language uh, that allows you to specify these prob com design problems in a simple way. And then once you do so, there is a solver that allows you to solve these uh, problems efficiently. So there is both the developer viewpoint and the user viewpoint. And now I want to show you some success stories, I think, from using this tool. Uh, here, the, some of the, exam the examples I want to show are inherent to the mobility forum efforts. Here we have a, an example where I want to show you how we can design or try to set up design problems for mobility systems, all the way from designing a, an entire interconnection of uh, mobility options to designing the particular mobility platform, such as an autonomous vehicle. Here, the kind of questions you want to answer as a, from the point of view of a municipality are, how many vehicles should we allow in a city? Which kind of vehicles? How should I invest in infrastructure or public transit to be able to interact with this? Uh, and which services should I encourage? Again, here, the task is the demand. And the things that we are designing is both the network and the mobility solutions. And here, it's the disciplines involved are really the ones you can see at this table. It's not just engineers, right? You have all sorts of people. Now, particularly, you can think of designing an intermodal mobility system where you want to design a set of autonomous mobility on demand services, as well as micro mobility and public transit. The, you, with some modeling, you can come up with the design diagram that represents the orchestration of the system as well as the design of the single mobility options. And uh, by specifying some particular functionalities or, or, or tasks, in this case, some demand patterns in Washington, DC, given certain cost structures and certain network properties, you can find optimal solutions in terms, for instance, of the average travel time in the city and the investments in, in, in your system, right? So you see as the more you invest, the, the lower this travel time becomes, and for each point on this Pareto front, so those are all uncomparable solutions, right? Because you have multiple objectives, you can say which ones are the vehicles you should have. So what speed should they drive at? How many vehicles should be in your fleet? The kind of mobility solu uh, micro mobility solutions you should use, such as electric scooters or uh, mopeds, and the number of trains or the frequency of the, the subway system. Now, the compositional properties of this framework allows you to zoom in and suddenly think about a more detailed model of your autonomous stack, for instance, for an autonomous vehicle, where you think about control, lateral and longitudinal, you think about perception, which sensors to use, which algorithms, and you also think about the computing units and the kind of vehicle you want to, to, to automate. And in the very same way, by specifying some set of scenarios, for instance, realistic uh, uh, curves or realistic roads, intersections that you have to traverse, you can now design uh, the particular algorithms that control the single vehicles. Uh, 
for instance, by choosing the controllers, the sensors you are using, the perception algorithms, and so on. So this is a kind of a slide summarizing many works that, that we have been doing. But the idea is that this tool allows you to specify details all the way from the software of a particular platform to uh, uh, deployment algorithms for an entire fleet or an entire mobility system, right? It, it allows this scaling uh, of, of, uh, of the problems. So going back to the, the original quest, it's very easy to embed new models continuously. It is collaborative because technically different people can uh, co co uh, contribute to the different components and it's intellectually tractable in the sense that you don't have to understand too many optimization principles to use this tool. Now, I, in the few minutes left before going to the exciting interactive discussion, I want to touch base on the second complexity that Genoa hinted at. So here, when you look at this kind of systems, it's obvious that you cannot only think about uh, optimization. You really have to think about the interactions between different stakeholders. And so you have to switch from a optimization perspective to an equilibria kind of perspective. So here you want to solve some kind of interactions or some kind of games. And what I want to get to slowly is the notion of co-design games. So the game theoretic uh, version of what I presented so far. And, and uh, we, we are not there yet, but we have some works in that direction. So we, to give you a sense, we are working on these interactions all the way from uh, settings in which you have robots that have to interact in complex environments, such as an intersection or uh, a warehouse where Amazon robots have to interact, all the way to interactions at the level of this table of people that have to take strategic decisions. And now I want to show you some, some, some work at the level of mobility design. So here, the interactions are very complicated and depend on the time horizon you're considering, right? If I just pre-specify some users, customers, municipalities, mobility providers, and public transport agencies, depending on the time frame you look at, you have different interaction patterns and different actions that could influence each other. So it's a very complicated uh, entanglement of interactions. But the typical setup is that you have some sort of authority that takes that that decides some rules. Then you have some mobility options that uh, are designed or are operated by reacting to these rules. Sometimes by trying to trick the rules, uh, as we have seen in the past years with some ride hailing companies. And then you have some reaction or some joint system that is built and some reaction from the customers. Right? And so one thing we have, we have been trying to do is modeling these se uh, uh, sequential interactions with uh, game theory, where you have uh, municipalities playing first, choosing, for instance, uh, rules or prices or taxes. Then you have mobility providers that react by choosing their particular operational strategies, the fleet sizes, the kind of service they want to provide. And finally, you have customers that react. Uh, here, of course, everybody has different objectives. And the, the really, depending on the models you use to assess what happens once the system is designed, you might have different ways to characterize the performance of the system. Here, I want to just show a case study in Berlin where we took a municipality deciding public transit prices as well as some taxes affecting uh, cars uh, or taxi operators. And then we had both autonomous taxis and normal taxis as well as micro mobility. And we took realistic networks, realistic demand patterns, and all the kind of uh, cost structures that you might, uh, might think of. And we characterized the equilibrium of these complex interaction patterns. Right? The idea is that you, you can characterize the equilibrium based on the revenue for the companies, the cost for the customers, and the cost for the emissions. So the kind of sustainability of your approach. And those are many equilibria. It's a very complicated problem. And then depending on the kind of action the municipality takes, you, you see that you can end up in a particular equilibrium that gives you particular design, design decisions, right? Uh, the thing is, from a computational point of view, you the decision of the municipalities uh, happens at the last step because you're, you're solving the problem backwards. But really, in reality, the municipality is the first taking action, right? So in some way, uh, it, it's still hard to be able to guarantee to end up in this equilibrium. And depending on the different actions of the municipality, you know, being revenue oriented, sustainability oriented, you can characterize different levels of, of equilibrium. Now, this is just to show you that we are sampling in this space of complex problems, but really what I'm trying to, to get to is to have some modeling and algorithmic foundations to solve these complex problems. 
keeping in mind realistic societal applications, so not living in academic, academia world where everything works on paper, but then it's very hard to deploy. And finally, I really believe in this view of deploying user-friendly tools. So not only uh, developing sound algorithms and writing cool papers that are published in journals, but also developing tools that can be used by the actual people that are operating the system and, and live with the system on an everyday basis. And here is just a sample of things I will do at MIT in my group. From the po technical point of view, you have to imagine those are very new tools and we have to deploy new modeling techniques, new algorithms, and new theories for, for capturing aspects that we haven't captured so far. From the point of view of applications, I showed some examples, but here really there is a whole suite of problems ranging from designing infrastructure together with operations, this coordinating different infrastructure, for instance, energy and mobility, thinking about other applications such as aerospace, automotive, production chain, data networks. So there is all sorts of complex systems that might profit from these kind of tools. And from the point of view of user friendliness, I really believe in being exposed to authorities and industry and really working at cl in close contact with tool people that actually have to use these tools. And if you visit my webpage and you will follow my group at MIT, we're really working hard on creating literature, workshop, classes to go out and evangelize people about the system level perspective to, to get to, to have more people believing in this, in this viewpoint. So if you go home with a take home message today, it's these systems require new formal and practical tools uh, to, to be designed. And uh, we have some first steps in that direction, but we need more people to think about these compositional uh, approaches. Um, here are some papers that I'm happy to discuss offline. And most importantly, I want to th thank some students that I worked with uh, and some uh, more senior collaborators, both at ETH, Zurich, and Stanford. Uh, and uh, and I'm at, I also shamelessly advertising that I'm hiring at MIT. I'm forming a group. I'm very excited. We have very good students that are joining the group. Um, and uh, and I look forward to, to working with them on these exciting problems. Also, since we are in a seminar and this these two overlap, uh, some years ago, I created this online series called Autonomy Talks. It's um, uh, not as famous as the Mobility Forum, uh, but if you are interested in these topics, every week we have a talk. We have had 180 talks so far, and, uh, and it would be great to, to see you there. Uh, and the recordings are on YouTube if you want to watch them offline. All right, I guess we can great. continue Thank to the interactive part. Sure, yeah. Th thank you so much, uh, Joe. Uh, it's totally fine to recruit students. Of the 200 participants today, hopefully a few of them are interested <laughs> in afterwards. Yeah. If you leave your email yeah. address in the chat, maybe many people will approach you on this. Right. So, Joe, mm -hmm. uh, I'll start with a few like a lower level technical question, and then gradually going up to see maybe the broader questions. Right. So, one mm -hmm. thing I'd like to help uh, elaborate a little bit more about this uh, uh, compositionality here. Right. So, you mentioned that uh, uh, through this approach, the complexity doesn't explode, right? It's not combinatorial, right? Uh, the fact mm -hmm. that the solution of a composition A and B actually equals the composition of a solution A and a solution B. So give us some intuition, well, why is this the case? Because most mm -hmm. of uh, the intuition that when you have a multiple bigger complex system, indeed it's combinatorial and it gets exploded. Why this approach can resolve that problem? Yeah, yeah, that's a very, very good question. So the, I, I give you two answers. The first answer is, it's true, the com complexity does not explode. However, the scale of systems you are considering is still very complex to solve. So the next 10 years of my, my research will be dedicated to being even better than this, right? But the reason why this does not explode is, uh, is purely technical. When you formulate these problems, uh, you, you, can find, uh, you can find out that when you know a, a solution map for a particular component, and you want to interconnect multiple components, there are simple formulas that allow you to, uh, to find the resulting solution map for the connected components. And this property of having monotonicity uh, from functionalities to resources results in, uh, in, the, in an algorithm that does not explode combinatorially. That's a purely technical reason. Mm, okay. However, however yeah. uh, now when you think about populating these different diagrams, uh, you you most often have complex processes doing so. So for instance, 
if you are from the mobility uh, operations uh, domain and you want to populate a system orchestrator, here you will have to run simulations or you will have to solve optimization problems that allocate resources in a network. This is something you still have to do, right? And somehow our approach is sampling from these solutions. But how to sample, how to be clever about which simulations to run, those are all questions that are open. So uh, all I'm saying is that once you specify some populations, the solution scales well. But how to how to orchestrate different complex uh, processes together, that's a still an open question. I see. So second, the kind of lower level question on the, uh, you, because many of the audience here uh, come from transportation familiar with optimization as a typical mm -hmm. framework, right? Uh, you, yeah. you mentioned that this, uh, the, the approach you take is, uh, is not exactly optimization, kind of a peculiar way of doing that, right? Give us a sense Ooh, of what, yeah. how would this new to differ from the classic optimization way of thinking? Yes, yes. So these, indeed, this is an optimization framework. Uh, it's If you were to classify it, uh, people people in operations research have all these classifications, for instance, this, could be a, this would be a multi-objective optimization problem. And mm -hmm. it's a particular class of multi-objective optimization problems where the objectives are uh, described as partially ordered sets, and the problem is specified with this graph of interconnected components. Now, it differs from, from uh, uh, some existing problems in two ways. The first way is purely technical. You have, uh, it, it's really a new definition and uh, you, you don't have convexity, you don't have differentiability, so you don't have many of the properties some people assume. But I think an important thing is non-technical. It differs from the spiritual point of view, from the conception point of view, which is I want people to be able to understand this optimization problem. And I don't want the specification of this optimization problem to be written in four pages of paper where there are all sorts of constraints and only a very technical expert can go and modify things. I want this mm. thing to be specified in a way that is intellectually tractable, which is through these diagrams, right? Mm. Um, so I, I think that those are the two ways in which it differs from from yeah, that, that's actually linked to the the desk the rata you you mentioned about the six desired mm -hmm. uh, properties of this uh, uh, design system yeah. here, one of them being the intellectually tractable. So the approach has not only accessible to expert uh, to this uh, chief architect architect or chief engineer, but also to a to a lay person there. And also you mentioned that. Uh, actually, we should conduct research on both aspects on it, right? Yeah. Yes, uh, give some yes. details about, uh, uh, do you see this as a tension to uh, the same time we're applying to applying this uh, 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 domain uh, uh, theory, this category theory, very abstract to maximum concept, while at the same time we say we want to be user friendly here. Right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So that's, the, that's a very uh, cool question. I think that's the eternal uh, dilemma we have as researchers. On one end, we are we are at the cutting edge of technology. We are trying to solve very complex problems, and sometimes we use tools that are really complicated, that uh, are at the edge of students studying for years, or something, right? But we should not forget this is the developer viewpoint. But we should not forget that in the end, the people using these tools uh, don't have these experiences sometimes, and sometimes they even care about different things. And so I really believe that we should deploy, develop the user viewpoint every time we, we come up with a new tool, right? Uh, I'll give you an example. Like everybody in, in optimization is using uh, CVX uh, as a solver for convex optimization problems, right? Uh, now, students these days are using this toolbox to solve their optimization problems, and they're just specifying the problem in the particular language, you know, specifying the matrices, the decision variables, pressing play, and the optimal solutions come out. And this is the way our pricing mechanisms for mobility options are done. This is the way resource allocation is done for most network systems. So it's something that's being used. But people, when they do it, they don't know about the particular optimization tools that are used in the background of the solver to be solved to, to, for the problem to be solved, right? In some way, what I'm trying to do is create this sort of common language for these socio-technical problems in a way that people don't have to understand what's going on in the background, but can, can focus on these uh, intellectually tractable aspect. Nice, thank you. So last question from me, and I'll give it to, to Ja. Uh, it's about the first uh, 
a desired property about this uh, formalism here, right? Uh, that requires a domain independent. Uh, so people use the coherent language, co coherent terminology to describe things. On that, I'd like to hear from you. First of all, is this is this achievable? I mean, is it can we formalize everything that we talk about? For example, coming from planning domain, we've been looking at this uh, multi-scale or multi-scale uh, complex system all the time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but rarely, uh, planning community is able to really formalize using a mathematical representation yeah. of this, right? So here, where do you see the potential limit to this approach? Or you think you will push yes, all yes. the way to formalize all the aspects? No, no, no. So you're you're very right in to, uh, in to pointing out this. So first of all, I started looking at these problems where you have problems such as uh, NASA engineers that want to design a complex systems and there they can specify everything and that's a system under under their control in some way. Now, when you want to explode these to socio-technical systems, of course, uh, it's hard to model certain things. Here, what I'm trying to do is some sort of democratization of the, um, of the design process. And in some way, I believe that focusing on the, if you think about it, this design framework, it's all about systems and the metrics of interest of these systems. So this is a, a level at which people can start reasoning about interactions. But then of course, right, you, uh, you, it's very hard to validate these things, for instance, or it's very hard to, um, to model exactly the demand or, or, or the reactions to different demand patterns. But in some way, I, I don't see this as, as the tool providing all the answers. I see this as the tool providing an interface for people to reason about these things. So imagine what I'm saying is, imagine you have uh, in a couple of years, I will have this interactive framework that allows people to take design decisions for a mobility system. I put it online and then different experts from mobility, from uh, uh, policy and so on, upload their models and they see how their models play together. And there is a sort of a democratic way to see uh, uh, how the solutions develop, right? So I'm tr just trying to find a common language be be between these very, very different stakeholders. But there yeah. is a lot of research to be done. I'm, I'm totally aware of that. I'm, I don't believe yeah. mathematics will solve everything. Yeah. On that point, I just this is actually important to to actually disentangle the engineering possibility from the value judgment, right? The the, mm -hmm. the currently the problem we 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 entangle those things being being mashed up together, right? But if mm -hmm. our contribution can distill the engineering possibility part and then leave the value judgment being very clearly defined. I think that itself is a very important contribution there, right? Exactly. So I'll give the uh, question to, to John for the journey. Thank you, Juno. Super, okay, well, thanks, Joel. We, uh, lots of comments. Um, this is a complex conversation, so I'm gonna try to <laughs> maybe bucket this into some different, some different pillars. Um, there's a stream that uh, so for Hughes uh, was uh, making a lot of questions and comments about kind of human centric design and sort of putting people at the center. Um, so I, I know you just touched on this, but do you have thoughts about like how this tool can really sort of like, let's consider the example of people moving around the Boston area. So you have tourists mm -hmm. who are visiting Boston in the summertime. You have people undertaking their daily commute. You have all these different people with different needs and different lifestyles. How does this tool sort of capture their interests on a, on a very human basis? Yes. So th this is a very good question. So I, I can give you the answer of how... I'm thinking about these problems, although the kind of results we have so far are, are limited. But the way I think about this is that when you design a mobility system that responds to people, you have certain uh, properties. You have, for instance, you are designing roads. You are deciding which roads are accessible by which kind of vehicle. You are deciding how many vehicles are entering the city, which kind of vehicles, which kind of public transit. Those things are design, design decisions that uh, can be modeled a priori, without knowing uh, who is going to use them and with which preferences. You know that by, to build a road, it takes some time, some money, and so on. Right. So I can create a co-design diagram that describes the design of this complex system. Now, the particular design solutions, or which one of those will be used in which scenario, 
deep, really depends from all these human uh, centric uh, properties. And here, the way I, I, I think about this is that for you, you have a task driven co design framework in the sense that depending on the boundary conditions, depending on the changes in human preferences, in the uh, costs for certain labor labor and so on, those are all parameters in the framework that you can change and you can um, and you can uh, and you can assess what the optimal design decisions are for those particular cases. The problem though is very complicated, right? Because you think about infrastructure, you design infrastructure with an horizon of maybe 20, 30 years, but things can change very rapidly. So here the problems are spatio-temporal. You're taking a decision now with some risk by modeling that the population will behave in some way and then COVID happens, for instance, or something like that happens. So there is a lot of research to be done or, or to be taken from people that model demand, for instance, and interconnected with this, this kind of framework that then develop, right? So, but as Jinwa said, I'm not prescribing in the framework any uh, human value or judgment uh, beforehand, right? I'm trying to be flexible by reacting to it. I hope this answers somehow to the to this question. Absolutely, and I I really like your comment, sort of implying that the the purpose of the tool is not to spit out answers, but the purpose of the tool is to provide an interface for yes. those different stakeholders. You use that picture of the folks around the table here in the the Boston area, so it's a tool that that they can use. I yes. you know I wonder though, um, have you thought about how? just to get those different stakeholders to embrace the tool in itself is a sort of complex marketing <laughs> exercise yes. and a behavioral shift exercise. Have you thought about that at all? Yes, so that, that's a very good question. I So my my I can give you my evil plan. My evil plan is to de develop this to a point where it's credible and can be applied very well to let's say mobility or energy in in, in and then have beta testers. Uh, and uh, and then these beta testers will kind of be testimonials that this work, and then I will I will uh, follow advice from many people and go to Washington D.C. I guess and and uh, and try to interact. Right? I have some past experience in doing this in Switzerland, but in Switzerland everything is pretty much centralized, so it was simple to get these people to like the tool. I'm fully aware that I will encounter many difficulties, but I. I believe this is the way to go to to form a sort of a common common language for this for these complex systems. But I'm totally aware of of the mess I'm, I'm putting myself into. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, You're a bold man. Uh, what well, look? <laughs> yes. Just building on that that stream about implementation. So uh, Tiffany Lim asked, "Has this framework been implemented previously in industry and or are there case studies?" I'd be curious to learn more about outcomes and experiences across different stakeholders. Now, you mentioned this example in Berlin as well. Maybe were there kind yeah. of specific actual outcomes and then decisions made based on the the not output? Yet. Oh? Not, not yet, not yet. So whenever we do our case studies, we try really hard to get, for instance, for mobility systems to get all the uh, real reports with uh, real uh, cost structures. So we, we don't have these fictitious case studies that sometimes you see in academia, but still this is not this, this was not in collaboration, in, for instance, with the city of Berlin. So one thing I'm really trying to do now as a faculty at MIT is to start interactions uh, with these uh, uh, with these stakeholders to use this in practice and to see also how the fact that different people can contribute to different parts of the system, can pose challenges. For instance, uh, just this morning we had a meeting, uh, Gino and I are part of a big grant uh, that will deploy some of these autonomous systems in Chicago, uh, hopefully. Uh, and there we have a, a full setup of interactions with not only engineers, but also transit agencies, uh, um, equity commissions, all sorts of stakeholders you can think of, right? So. I really, this is really fresh. It's uh, so far uh, the only group that's working on this. It's it's my group. So uh, it mm -hmm. really needs more people to go out and and evangelize and even new ideas to come in. Okay, that's great. I want to bring up a question posed by Jane Chu, um, and I know mm -hmm. you touched on some of the components of her question, but this is I I, I think this really captures the essence. 
She asks, is this approach mainly useful for optimizing efficiency within systems? How does it deal with paradigm shift slash black swan type events? So you, you mentioned sort of COVID. What if there is a policy goal to design a new system that doesn't exist yet, e.g. solving global climate change? Do you mm -hmm. have any thoughts on sort of these? Because you mentioned ideally the tool should plug in. It should be like a kind of modular structure where one system plugs into another system. Maybe tell yeah. us more about how you're thinking about this interface between, say, the transportation system on the one hand and the energy system on the other hand. Yes, that, that's a very good question. And it's actually, from the technical point of view, it's a different way of specifying the query you're looking for. I can give you an example. Like I have now a project that works on uh, understanding how much of the autonomy can be uh, from a single autonomous vehicle can be outsourced to the infrastructure. The principle here is that uh, autonomous vehicle might not get to the capabilities they are required to fulfill very soon. And so a, a way to fully profit from the technology could be to start in, instrumenting roads and, uh, and, uh, and having this sort of outsourcing and at some point gradually get to the situation in which the vehicle uh, is fully automated. Now, of course, if uh, one query could be, what would be the optimal design of the infrastructure today? And today, the answer would be, okay, let's instrument Boston area entirely. Let's put sensors. Let's spend a lot of money. If instead I ask you the question, okay, let's to take the projections for the next 20 years. What is the optimal solution there? There are probably there's going to be a high risk situation in which next year Waymo solves the problem and all the infrastructure is is to be thrown away. And another uh, situation in which instead for 10 years, we could profit from the infrastructure, right? So in some sense, I want to provide the framework to reason about these different edge cases, but I, I don't want myself to be saying which ones are the ones that will happen. I would rather provide the tool to the stakeholders at this table that you mentioned to, to take projections, to do projections and, and to think about the, the different things that could happen in a formal way. Um, and this does not only apply to mobility, right? We have similar things for, for NASA. We, for instance, are working with companies producing sensors that say, okay, should we invest in this sensor technology if in five years we get to these properties? And that's an open question, right? So those are all the sorts of problems we are looking at. Excellent. Well, unfortunately, I think we're at time, so I'd turn it back to Jim. Thank you, John. Yeah, indeed, it's one o'clock. I just want to name one question from Rabbi Michelani. How are such to evaluate and validate for realism effectiveness? We probably don't have time to answer, but Joe will package this question for you for you to think of it all offline, Joe it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Joe, yeah. first of all, thank you so much for joining us today. And I think it's MIT's fortune to have you join us as a faculty in the fall. Uh, thank you so much. I, I think there's so much more to be discussed in this, right? One thing yes, I would say yes. is that if your tool can, can help elevate the quality of our public debate and public discourse itself, that's a major contribution we can have on this, right? So uh, please, everyone, join me. Thank uh, Professor Joe Zabini for the presentation today. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And feel free to reach out. I, I'll, I'll type my email in the chat. Feel free to reach out if you have thoughts, ideas applications, critiques, everything. Like uh, this is starting now. So I really want to to hear about uh, about what you think. That's wonderful. Thank you, Jinwa, for the invite inviting me. Great. Yeah. Thanks everybody. See you next Friday.